Welcome everyone to the beginning of the 6th annual Dragon Ball Dissection December, my month-long Dragon Ball Dissection Marathon. I am Mister Fusion, and we will be covering quite a bit this month, with three more additions to the Cell arc in the main series, as well as one movie, and one, well, uh, uh, kind of two specials. So it looks as though the timing worked out so the material will be just as diverse as last year. When I announced the lineup, I got several comments from people that seemed to imply I actually choose when I cover certain material. So just as a reminder, or in case you don't know, I slot in movies and specials at the point they occur in the release of the series. Movie 7 is here in the middle because that's when it happened. I'm covering Trunks the Special not long afterwards because that's when it came out. The only exception is DBD TV. It would be impossible to place concurrently running episodes where they land in the manga release schedule without stopping every five minutes. So, for the sake of simplicity, I exclusively handle that branch of the Dragon Ball Dissection family in between manga story arcs. So, if you've been asking when the next DBD TV episode is going to happen, it won't be until after the Cell arc is completed. And with that out of the way, on with the show. Cell uses the blinding light of the Taiyo Ken to escape from Piccolo, and with several of the others arriving on the scene, Piccolo fills them all in. I hate to keep hammering in this point, no I don't, but Piccolo makes the plan clear. Stop Cell while he's weak, before he can absorb number 17 and number 18. Once again showing that when the plot no longer requires them to be dumb, they won't be. The only dissenter is Vegeta, but even his objection is rooted in some common sense. Let Cell absorb the artificial humans, that way it will only be one opponent to find and take down rather than three. Well, I guess technically it would be two opponents as opposed to four, since there'd still be a number 16. Vegeta's only error in judgment, in Piccolo's eyes, is assuming he's strong enough to handle a completed cell. But Vegeta asserts he will go beyond Super Saiyan, and flies off. The group splits up again. Piccolo and Ten Shinhan attempt to track down Cell, and remember, Ten Shinhan was the guy who had previously said he wanted to wait for the artificial human so he could test his training, proving once again that yada 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 you get the point. Trunks and Kredidin, meanwhile, head to Dr. Garrow's lab to find this timeline's version of Cell, so they won't have to face this threat again, which means that they are so dedicated to being proactive that they will kill Cell even before he's done anything wrong. Okay, I'm done. Anyone find Cell's life cycle to be very odd? So, this is the earliest stage we see him in, and he's a tiny embryo, resembling a developing human baby. But after he finishes gestating in this form, he apparently becomes a giant egg. Does that seem out of order to anybody else but me? Or did Dr. Garrow design him so that he becomes an egg only if he embarks on a zany scheme involving time travel that requires him to be smaller? At any rate, that plot thread is wrapped up and they find schematics to number 17 as well, which they hope will lead to a weakness being found once they're taken back to Bluma. Trunks, for his part, follows after Vegeta because he wants to go beyond Super Saiyan as well. The group hear of Cell's exploits on TV, rush out in the plane so Cell won't sense them, but they can never find him. He just crawls away and hides like some kind of, well, bug. I both like this and don't like this. It's relieving to see the heroes be proactive, use methods of technology to aid them, and act strategically rather than relying simply on brute force. And it's just damn hilarious to see Piccolo sitting around at Kame House, watching TV at what looks like a slumber party. He looks wonderfully out of place there every time. And picking up the theme from Dr. Garrow, I like seeing a villain hiding from the heroes, using key manipulation, their own trick against them. However, I don't feel enough is done with the concept. We only see one example of Piccolo and Ten Shinhan exploring a town where Cell is currently hiding, and that's all of a page and a half. 
The rest of the time, we just see them en route or on the way back. At one point, they even open with a darn, we just missed him. As a result, Cell ends up losing quite a bit of his terror factor. To take it back to the horror movie analogies, yeah, you want to keep the villain in the shadows while he does his killing so he stays frightening, but you still need to see some killings, or more shots of empty clothing, to remind us of the horrifying effect Cell is having. There is nothing that approaches the level of fear induced by his first appearance and that disgusting consuming of that man. We never see Cell drain a regular person ever again. We're just told about it. And that's a shame. Although I don't really know what's going on with that guy. I guess Cell had to stop before he was finished? I wonder how it feels to be half drunk. You know what I mean. And talk about not being in the shadows, Cell is apparently posing for the television cameras. Chi-Chi walks up to the Kame House attic to find that Goku is finally well. He knows what's going on because he heard everyone talking in his dreams. I... guess that can kind of work? Maybe? If I was him, I'd still want some clarification to be sure, for example, the talking bug man wasn't just my subconscious screwing with me while I slept. Obviously, Toriyama is attempting to move the plot along without having to repeat exposition, which is good. But this isn't one of those moments like with the Ginyu where the situation is so urgent that nobody would have the time to bring him up to speed. It would in no way break the pace to have Goku ask, What's going on? Doodly doodly doodly. And that's what happened. There was no need to come up with a credibility straining explanation for why Goku knows everything in explicit detail. Anyway, like Vegeta, Goku also states he is going to surpass Super Saiyan. Pretty interesting coincidence they both had the same unique idea at around the same time, unless Goku even managed to hear Vegeta in his dreams too. But he plans to take Gohan and train in the Room of Spirit and Time, a never-before-mentioned area in Kami's palace, inside of which a year can be spent in only a day of real time. Now, I don't mind that this place exists, or that it just came out of nowhere. I can buy the explanation that when Goku had trained with God and Popo in the past, he couldn't handle the experience, and as such, it wouldn't really come up in conversation. Maybe Goku would have mentioned his prior experience with increased gravity when he met the Lord of Worlds, but eh, that's barely a blip of a concern. Clearly, this place didn't actually exist in the past, but the retcon fits in relatively seamlessly, with one exception. Whether it's intentional or not, I'm pleased at how well the concept of a room of spirit and time fits with the anime's previous inventions of time and space manipulating rooms existing there. Also, it does fully cement the soft reboot trajectory I've talked about. Everyone dismissing reasonable solutions to threats? Forget about that, they're taking threats seriously now. And those three years of training? Mostly worthless. The real dramatic changes are happening now. Piccolo assimilating God, and Goku and the others going beyond Super Saiyan, in the room of spirit and time. Basically, the setup of the arc is completely redone, but better. Reducing everything prior to a collection of false starts. What I do have a problem with is in that soft reboot nature. Don't get me wrong, I'm glad Toriyama's getting it right this time. But in-universe, it does make those three years seem really, really pointless. Vegeta achieves Super Saiyan, sure, and develops one new generic attack, but nobody else really seems any different. For example, Gohan dramatically powers up and even more dramatically ages in the single year he's in the room, but in those wasted three years, he barely changes at all, despite training with Goku in both situations. And while I buy the Room of Spirit and Time not being brought up as a viable option in earlier circumstances, there's no good reason why he wouldn't have mentioned it here. Goku was well-versed in much heavier gravity by the time Trunks showed up. In the face of this Destiny foretold us we're going to die scenario, it retroactively makes it look like he was taking the threat even less seriously than before, and I didn't even think that was possible. None of the excuses presented at the time preclude Goku and the others from wanting to become as strong as they could. But now, suddenly he's all, let's go in the magic training room I never bothered to mention before. Three years didn't do us the slightest bit of good, and neither did that other year we skipped over before that, but if we just had one extra year, that would have made all the difference. So maybe we should have gone in there for one year before. It only would have taken a day, then... Most of these terrible things wouldn't have happened. Hindsight's 2020, I guess. 
But at any rate, it's here now, and Goku, Gohan, Vegeta, and Trunks are all going to take advantage of it. Because arbitrary magical rules dictate the room can only be stocked for two people at a time, Vegeta and Trunks go in first while Goku and Gohan continue to do what they've done most of this arc. Sit on ass. Hey, you know what would be useful? Everyone's complaining they can't get to Cell's location fast enough before he notices them and hides his key. If only someone had some kind of key-tracking-based skill that allowed him to move from place to place instantly. And if only that person had a free day. But such ideas are the ramblings of a madman. But I'd be remiss not to at least mention this scene between Goku and Chi-Chi, where she finally acquiesces to Goku's request to take Gohan with him. There aren't a lot of scenes between Goku and Chi-Chi at all, but this one subtly demonstrates that while they do butt heads, the two really do understand each other on a certain level. I guess you could call this a soft reboot of Goku accidentally knocking her into a tree. Then again, Chi-Chi gives in on the condition that once this is over, Gohan gets to study and Goku gets a job. Boy, it'd be a real shame if Goku died before this conflict was over. So with all this stuff about chasing down Cell, flying in planes, the narrator mentioning almost an entire day having passed since Vegeta and Trunks entered the room, not to mention all the earlier stuff involving them having to race from one hemisphere to another, you know what I've noticed a distinct lack of in this story arc? Night! Remember when we used to see the passage of time in this series? Day would turn into night, which would give rise to a new dawn, and it would help give the events a sense of progression and realism? Yeah, I miss that. Apparently when the Namekians came to Earth, they brought their three sons with them and forgot to take them back when they left. And when Toriyama realized he no longer wanted to ink Goku's hair, he also no longer wanted to ink the sky. The only time we see night in this entire arc? Right here. Just this one panel. Although I guess you could count this one shot of the Earth from space. And yeah, the characters are super fast, we're not seeing every event, and if they are traveling longitudinally, there is certainly a possibility we just don't happen to see nighttime events, but it does seem all too convenient, doesn't it? Speaking of not needing to ink things, the Room of Spirit and Time consists of two Toriyama design hallmarks. It's both very fascinating and very empty. Aside from the entry room, it is nothing but white space, and I am not the least bit surprised at this point. But I still really like it. Toriyama's design strengths are often in their simplicity. It's not hard to imagine why it is so difficult to spend a significant amount of time here. The gravity is surely not a problem anymore, but fluctuating temperatures and the extreme psychological stress of living in nothingness has to be daunting. Of all the sitcoms I've seen, and I've seen many, where two characters who don't get along are conveniently trapped in a space where they have to work out their issues, I've never seen a writer go with throwing them into the hell mouth of the void. That wacky Toriyama. Okay, you know what? I think I get this. The lack of night, the room of spirit and time. I think it's all because Toriyama and his assistant spent all their time inking every single spot on Cell and every single panel he appeared in. They probably didn't have any ink left over after that. I love first form Cell's design, but I don't know what Toriyama was thinking when he put himself through that. I don't think he knows. Anyway, the artificial humans have reached Goku's house to find it empty, and since number 18 is next seen walking out of the house wearing an outfit we've never seen before, I used to seriously wonder why on earth Chi-Chi owned an outfit like that. Don't get me wrong, this is leagues better than that stupid cowgirl outfit, but the way it's presented is kind of confusing, especially since the story went out of its way before to show her getting new clothes. But since Goku's not there, number 16 is through playing games, and simply states he's probably at Kame House. So they fly to Kame House, interrupting the slumber party. All that time Piccolo has spent watching his soap operas on the Turtle Sage's TV has made him a master of the area, so he knows right where there are some uninhabited islands just perfect for fighting. Get comfy. We're gonna be here for a while, folks. <laughs> 